Okay, there, CR Fest. I am super excited. And when I say, I know, I know, I say super excited a lot, but this time I actually am very excited to have with me Dr. Elaine Stagerberg of Black Swan Real Estate um, to basically come share with us how they have pivoted their massive portfolio to include short-term rentals. And I, you know what? Just welcome, Elaine. I'm really excited to have her on on with us. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Would you mind just sort of like introducing yourself to the audience, um, basically sharing, you know, who you are, what you do and why we're having this conversation to date? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Elaine Stagerberg. I'm a psychiatrist by training, though I haven't practiced medicine for a few years now. I've been a real estate investor for about, I guess this is year 13, so 13 years. Historically have done all long-term residential real estate. I'm sure we'll talk in yeah. our time here together about how historically we would buy apartment buildings where someone else was operating some of the units as short-term rentals, and we would actually decommission those short-term rentals and convert them into long-term rentals. Um, so we have a rather large real estate portfolio today. We have about 300 million in assets under management. About two thirds of that is in Rochester, Minnesota, home of the Mayo Clinic. That's where 100% of our short-term rental portfolio is, and we'll talk about why. About, a, about one third of our portfolio is in Tacoma, Washington. At this point, we're about 95% long-term rentals, about 5% short-term rentals. We're deeply vertically integrated. So we work with investors directly. My husband's a broker, brokers our own deals. We have a property management company, Black Swan Living. That company also manages our short-term rentals. Now we do our own renovations, our own cleaning, all of the things to drive performance to our assets. So we typically work with passive investors. We're the active partners. We do all of the heavy lifting and then share those profits out from our real estate with our investors. Amazing. Amazing. And, 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 and I know I know I hinted at this at first because a lot of people who listen to to our to our stuff here at Savvy Docs um, are looking for deal sponsors, you know, people to invest with. And that's why I I I brought you on. Or oh, that's part of why I brought you on, because people are usually looking for, okay, like, you know, who can I trust? Who knows what they're doing? And so being able to sort of introduce to the audience, you know, possible possible people. Hey, you know what? I don't necessarily, you know, vet anybody before, you know, but I I just know that having seen you work with you, spoken with you. You sound like you know what you're doing. <laughs> I appreciate that endorsement. Thank you. Just a little bit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So kind of just walk us briefly sort of through your journey from I'm a doctor, I'm a psychiatrist going through, you know, medicine and all of that into now I am a real estate investor with $300, $300 million worth of assets under management. Yeah, absolutely. So it absolutely was a journey. Uh, I'll try to consolidate it here to just a few minutes and kind of hit on the pivotal points. But remember that it was a decade plus journey. Yeah. Um, so my husband and I started out as you know what is called accidental landlords. So we both owned a home when we got married. We decided to keep his home, live in it, and then keep my home and convert that to a rental. I liked that, that that was in 2011. So it wasn't exactly the bottom of the bottom, but it was pretty close. The reason mm -hmm. we converted that home into a rental is because we would have needed to basically deplete our entire life savings just to sell it because it had lost so much value in the crash. And it was so neat to see that it was producing some cash flow. There was a really lovely family living in it. Um, we managed it ourselves. So we were able to get that experience. Of course, the mortgage was being paid down and then the market was improving over those years. So that's really where we got bit by that real estate bug. Our first purposeful rental was a few years later where we saved up money and intentionally bought a home that we never lived in. You know, the purpose of that was to be a rental. Mm -hmm. We've always had a Burr business model. So that's buy, renovate, refinance, rent, repeat. We've never sold a single asset. We've always been a big believer in deep value add, trying to force appreciation of those properties. We've always self-managed all the way from that very first one, really believing that operations is everything. Operations is really where you drive profitability after that value add plan. And then just the portfolio grew and grew and grew. And then we started working with passive investors. Then we did joint ventures for many years. Then we opened our private equity funds, which is the model yeah. that we have now, which is basically many people put money into the bucket. We buy many properties with that bucket of money and then share out those profits. And then along the way in 2023, kind of you know, honing in on, on that year, as we all know, interest rates increased drastically. Inventory really took a crunch as interest rates increased. And so we have this rather large portfolio that we own and operate. 
And instead of focusing our time on acquisitions, which is really the mode we've been in for the last decade plus, yeah. we said to ourselves, how do we get more profit out of what we already own? Mm -hmm. Because acquiring new feels a little bit impossible right now, mm -hmm. but we want to continue to grow. So kind of the way I think of it is like a biological being can grow in size mm -hmm. or it can grow in strength. Yep. And so in 2023, we said, hey, growing in size is going to be a little bit challenging this year. How can we instead grow in strength? How can we optimize and maximize what we currently have? And so that, that's why we shifted part of our portfolio to short-term rentals so that we could increase the cash flow from those individual units and increase the profitability of the overall portfolio. Amazing. Amazing. Now, when did you start this addition or pivot, should I say? Maybe optimization? With the short-term rentals? Yeah. Um, about six months ago. So okay. right now we're in January of 2024. So we started in summer of 2023. Okay. And what, what did that involve for you? I guess going to take us behind the scenes in terms of, okay, now, how did you choose which units that you were going to convert? How many of them you would, you would convert and then planning out the whole budget for the conversion for those units? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So we decided that we would only convert portions of our portfolio in Rochester, Minnesota. So our Tacoma portfolio is still entirely long-term rental. The reason for that is Rochester, Minnesota is home of the Mayo Clinic, consistently rated the best hospital in the country, the best hospital in the world. And Mayo had announced a very large expansion. Mm -hmm. And so we knew that Rochester would continue to grow and that our long-term portfolio would continue to thrive in terms of increased rents and increased value of that portfolio. But we also knew that there would be an increase in the number of patients coming to town, right? We're essentially a tourist town for medical tourism. But that's many years away because it takes many years to build the hospital, staff them, all of the things. But in the near term, there would be an influx of people living in Rochester for a short duration who are construction workers. So as they're bringing in plumbers and masonry work and carpenters and you know, all of the professions that are needed to build these hospitals, yeah. there would be that influx of people needing short and medium term stays here in Rochester. So that was really the impetus where we said, hey, 2023, interest rates are high, inventory is low, growing in size is proving to be challenging. How can we increase the profitability of the portfolio? Mayo has this expansion that's going to lead to a, a need for more short-term rental units several years from now. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, there will be increased demand for people who are the construction workers building these hospitals. So let's convert a portion of the portfolio. Mm. At the same time, we coincidentally had acquired the largest asset in our portfolio. It's called Residences of Discovery Square. It's a 129-unit Class A brand new apartment building built in 2019 that looks and feels like a hotel. Mm -hmm. It has a gym, underground parking, amenity space, you know, a beautiful entryway with multiple sitting areas. And so for us, we felt like that was the best portion of our portfolio to convert some of that to a short-term rental. We did convert some other things. Things, and I'm sure we'll, we'll mm -hmm. talk about that mm -hmm. in the scope of our interview. But we wanted to have a portion of the portfolio that was very consistent, that was downtown, located very close to Mayo Clinic, that was you know, essentially brand new. So it would appeal to anyone. It wouldn't have any of the corks or charms, however you want to describe mm -hmm. it, of some of mm -hmm. buildings located downtown. Um, it would be easy to you know, furnish them the same way because it's right. the exact same floor plan. We'd have one caretaker there managing the cleaning and all of the things. So that was kind of the big bite of the apple that we bit off first. And then I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about more about how we operationalize that. But that tells you kind of the mindset we were in in 2023, uh -huh. what was happening in our local market that presented this opportunity, and then why we chose the specific building to be the cornerstone of our short-term rental portfolio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's 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 go on to then talk about how, the how. And um, first of all, I think I think I remember hearing some of that that was a hundred units or so. Exactly. So we have we have a thousand units in Rochester, and the goal is that by this summer, so about four or five months from now, we have one hundred short term rental units inside of that one thousand unit portfolio. Okay. And and how many have you been able to convert so far? We have about 20. 20. So we're finding that it takes about a week each. Yeah. So if you do the math, you might be thinking, Elaine, where are you going to get the other 80? So in the beginning, we were ramping yeah, up right. a little bit more slowly yeah. to get some at-bats at it, to figure things out, get our processes figured out. 
we have found out that it takes about 40 to 48 human hours per unit. That's a con consistent pattern that we found over that 20 to order all the furniture, assemble all the furniture, place all the art, you know, do all the things, get that final clean, that final media, get it listed on the portals. And so we're ramping up our team so that we can have the maximum number of units going into our season, which is like May, June, July, August, okay. where the weather's nice and a lot of people are traveling to Rochester for medical care. Okay. 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 And um, what size units are you converting? How many um, rooms and um, how many bedrooms and baths? So the ideal portion of the portfolio we have found is that two bedroom, one bath units mm -hmm. struggle on the long-term rental side. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of work backwards from the ideal client on the long-term rental side, people are either a single person that are fine with a studio or a one bed, or they're a romantically involved couple where they want, you know, one bed or two bedrooms. Um, but if they want two bedrooms, they typically want two bathrooms if it's a roommate situation. Yep. And so that, again, there's all these kind of pieces we're coming together. When we looked at our downtown portfolio, and by downtown, I mean close to Mayo Clinic, the two bedroom, one bath units struggled from a long-term rental perspective, but we thought, hey, I bet these will do great for short-term rental because yeah, maybe you want a second bathroom for your kids when you're at home, but you're fine, you know, using one bed bathroom yep. for you know a few days stay we are doing a mixture of all units depending okay. on what's available but that's the main portion that we're trying to target okay yeah no that that makes a lot of sense that actually that absolutely makes makes a lot of sense now now when you decided okay you know what we're gonna do this what was your what was your sort of like the first thing that you decided to actually do because you hadn't done short-term rentals before before mm -hmm. this <laughs> correct so what was your like first thing in terms of like, was it just you and Nick, for example, saying anything about it? Or was it like you and the team? And like, what was, what was that process like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Nick there that she's referring to, that's my husband and, and business partner. We run our company together. Um, so Nick and I are big believers in being in what's called the Gemba. That's the Japanese word for the place of real work. So if you're an executive at Toyota, you're actually on the floor where they you know, put together Toyota automobiles. So we are big believers in that. And we thought, you know, if we're transitioning 10% of our portfolio, 10% of a rather large portfolio, we need to be deeply involved with that. So we did assemble a team. We're very fortunate that in our property management company, about a third of our staff come to us from the hospitality industry. So we have a formal general manager of a Hilton, a formal general manager of a Marriott, um, several local hotels. Obviously, there's a lot of hospitality in Rochester. Yeah. And so as we grew the company, we specifically recruited people from the hospitality industry, not ever knowing that we would eventually do right. hospitality, but just believing that property management should be a hospitality, hospitality. first industry, yeah. right? So that was super helpful that they knew these are the exact sheets that we should have. And this is what people are looking for and what people don't want. And, you know, they had that mindset from coming from the world of hotels. We have one person that's kind of our team captain, our lead in putting all of this together, bringing the units into service, ordering all of the furniture, doing all of those things. But Nick and I have been very hands-on. We want to touch all of the furniture, touch all of the dishes, understand that you know, if we get say this set of dishes from Costco and this set of dishes from Amazon, they might be the same price, but they're completely different quality. So if we're going to build out a hundred units of these, right, we don't want three or four or five or six or seven different sets of dishes. We want all the same dishes. So making that decision might take a few hours, but then we have a hundred sets of dishes, a hundred sets of all of the linens, the furniture, all of the things we're basically setting them up that the core furniture is essentially the same. And okay. then our general linens, like our bedding and our bathroom linens will be the same, but our sort of decorative linens, like bedspreads, any throws that are on the, the couches, and then our art will be different so that they do feel a little bit different. They have a homey feel. It doesn't, you know, when you're like looking at say the listings on the platforms, it doesn't feel like a hotel. It feels like each one of them is individualized, but from an operations perspective, if a glass is broke or a sheet gets stained or, you know, what have you, we're just able to supplement those things. And so we have been very hands-on. I'd estimate we're spending probably about a third of our time on this short-term rental conversion of the portfolio. And then we have a team that's supporting us. And then of course our team of cleaners and maintenance people that are, you know, the doing the day-to-day -day operations and turnovers. Yeah. I remember when I first, when I saw your first post about short-term rentals and I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. 
But I was, I was actually like curiously surprised, should I say, and I'm not sure if those two words go together. When I saw your post of actor, like you unloading up the car and getting like mm-hmm. kids in there. And I was like, huh, interesting. I wonder what mm-hmm. she's doing. Right. But it yeah. makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense because you, I have a, I have a, I have a thing on my board right here where I said, um, Territory is about amplification, but you should not amplify crap. Um, okay, exactly. <laughs> I love that. I love that <laughs> because yeah, like if if you spend the time now, and then then at scale, it's not absolute chaos and poor quality. Absolutely, absolutely. So making those line. key decisions early yeah. on, because the intent is to convert ten percent of our entire portfolio making sure that we're picking the right units in the right buildings, furnishing them appropriately, getting the right linens and kitchen goods and all of those things. So making a small number of strategic decisions that then exactly like you said, amplifies that portion of the portfolio. Cause the last thing we want to do is make say, you know, a poor decision on dishes. And then we yeah. have quality problems over the next year where we have to, you know, it's expensive. If let's say we had to replace all of our dishes in a hundred units or replace some of them, but then we have mismatched things. And, you know, you can just, you can feel the chaos in that situation. So trying our best to be in the Gemba, in the place of real work, making those key strategic decisions, and then telling our team, this is the, the recipe to implement yeah. in these yeah. 100 units. Yeah. So how has it been? In terms of, it has know, gone, yeah. Yeah, it has gone really well. I would say it has gone better than we anticipated. So the majority of our units so far have come on to service in what is the low season here. So like October, November, December, most of the time we're 100% occupied. Um, Just yesterday on January 1st, we were 90% occupied, which I felt like was a a really good number for a time that it's a relative lull in Rochester, right? If if the clinic's not open, then you would, one would think that our short-term rentals, you know, would not be filled, but they are. It must be people either you know, finishing up some appointments or planning for appointments this coming week or, you know, here to visit their family members. Um, people have been, you know, very easy to work with, very gracious, very grateful people. We've not had any customer service nightmares or those sorts of things. We've had a few things where someone has said, um, you know, you forgot the tea kettle or, you know, can, can I have some extra blankets or people are not, People are shocked at how cold it is here. So can I have a space heater? Those are, so it's easy for us to say, hey, let's just have a space heater at every unit because it is yeah. much colder here than you know other parts of the country. Or, you know, let's let's create this checklist where we make sure we have every single piece. Let's have a cleaning checklist so that as our cleaners are going in, they're checking the inventory of everything. Cause that is very different than a long-term rental. Yeah turnover where the point is empty everything out versus no you need to make sure the coffee's there and the creamers and all the you know little things that we provide Um, but I would say all in all it has gone better than we have expected revenue has been stronger reviews have been great and what we're really excited about is looking at the pricing software we we use price labs and seeing what our target rents will be in the high season. And that's what really excites us of if those numbers are true in price lab, that that is yet to be determined. We've not experienced a high season, but if those numbers and occupancy rates are true, the profitability of this experiment will be outsized. And, and you know, the, the reason we are not converting our entire portfolio is because of regulation in Rochester, yeah, okay. only 25% of units in any given apartment building can be operated as a short-term rental, which Rochester describes as 30 days or less. So that's okay. why we've decided 10% across the entire portfolio. Um, but so far, you know, full steam ahead, we're very excited about the early results that we're seeing. I love it. I love it. And I like, I think one thing that, 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 that kind of popped in my head as you were talking was, you know, as we're talking about this, and for those who are listening, some people may be listening from the from, 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 from standpoint of, okay, well, you know, that's great that their portfolio is big, but you know that even at a small level, the things that you mentioned are pretty are pretty important. Like if you if you if you cannot steward one property, how can you uh-huh. steward ten? If you cannot steward fifteen, how can you steward one hundred and fifty? Um, so mm-hmm. definitely gems to be picked up. Um, both for those who are who are who are thinking of scaling, because what you just described right now is really just principles of scaling, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and for those who are thinking of having one, because if you mm-hmm. if you have just if you have just one and you can operate it like like you had a hundred, imagine how much more profitable you could be with that one. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great time to throw in that, you know, historically, we have been pretty anti short term rental, we would acquire apartment buildings that, you know, the previous owner was operating some percentage of them as short term rentals. And we would, you know, literally put all the furniture out on the curb and have a, you know, free sign on Craigslist and just give everything away. And, and, you know, decommission those as short-term rentals. A lot of that was the pandemic. That Rochester was hit, you know, like many places, very seriously through the pandemic. Rochester is a bit different than many other markets because it, it's a tourist town, but it's not a v- vacation town. So mm-hmm. domestically, many vacation hotspots did very, very well through the pandemic as people weren't able to fly. They didn't want to go internationally because of COVID testing, all of those restrictions. Well, Rochester struggled because people said, you know what, I'll just get my care locally rather than you know doing all the travel Mm. through COVID. And now kind of the opposite is true as sort of the world has opened back up and people are able to fly, go internationally. Some of the domestic vacation hotspots are maybe struggling a little bit in terms of occupancy or price, but Rochester's really coming back. And then this big hospital expansion, my, my kind of drumbeat that I've had all along is that if someone is going to do short-term rental, what makes sense to me, and again, I've learned in, in, any type of investing, real estate investing, this is very much an art and people can do different things. And that's that's the beauty of capitalism is that we yep. can all find exactly what works for us. But what always made sense to me is find a property that has optionality, that you could operate as a long-term rental or a mid-term rental. You could operate furnished or unfurnished. You could sell it to a typical homeowner. It always felt maybe a little bit risky to me, people buying homes that are essentially like quasi hotels mm-hmm. that are you can you know, tend to only sell to another investor. Mm-hmm. Again, many people do that and are wildly successful. This is just yep. my investment thesis. So if someone wanted to do short-term rental, basically the guidance I used to give is, you know, hey, I don't do short-term rental, but if I was going to, I would pick something that can be operated as a long-term rental, can be sold to a typical homeowner where there's lots of different plans that you can do based on what's happening in the economy. And that's basically what I did was I then looked at my portfolio and said, I could operate these as you know typical long-term rental units in this apartment building. That was the plan when we acquired yeah. these buildings, mm-hmm. but there's an opportunity here to pivot, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully for many years to make good on the furniture and all of the effort that's put into it. But let's say five or six years from now, these furnishings are wearing out, things aren't working out, you know, we just kind of the market has shifted. I don't think that's going to happen because of hospital of the future, but just, you know, play that hypothetical game. Markets shift all the time that we would just convert them back to long term rental. I think that's really the name of the game in any type of investment, but particularly a real estate investment is have many different plans to successfully operate and then eventually sell that piece of real estate. That is that is so smart. That is so wise. And I think anyone listening really should go back and just hit re- hit, hit rewind a few times. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> because because you know, one thing that I that I recognize as a risk for for um the the, the folks that kind of talk publicly is that sometimes people hear what you say and think that it's a prescription. They think it's like, okay, you see black, you do white. You know what I'm saying? But everything is nuanced like absolutely <laughs> i mean why. we had a, like a whole drum beat going and then 2023 hit with like interest rates like up the roof and it's like okay so are short term rentals still a thing well it's like that's not the question <laughs> mm. the question is what are the principles that underlie your investing and how does it work in the current in the current market absolutely um, and markets are so local, right? Yes. Even in the, you know, in the, you know, we've talked about why we love Rochester, why we, we're doing this short-term rental expansion in Rochester because of the Mayo Clinic Hospital expansion. But even in, say, the broad overall market of, let's say, luxury luxury vacation rentals, something that's beachfront might operate very differently than something that's mountain. Two beaches in the same state might operate very, very differently. Real estate is hyper local. So knowing your specific market of where you're planning to acquire is really the name of the game, right? Like the, the mantra in real estate is location, location, location. That is so true. And understanding the local dynamics in that market trumps anything that any of us say on the internet. Absolutely. drop. (laughs) <laughs> up the mic, close the computer, let's go. That is so true. So basically what you're saying is that there are no shortcuts to understanding your market. 
I think so. I, I think that's the most important thing is understanding the market and then particularly having what I call an unfair advantage or an asymmetric advantage in that market. So I'm a big believer in if at all possible, invest locally yes. where you just know that market, you know it in your bones, you know, this street's good, that street's not so good. There's a new school coming in over here, a new park. This is where all the hot restaurants are. You can figure out those things online, but it's pretty hard. I think the next best market is something that's within a car ride from your home. So say yep. two to three hours. The next best market is something that you have some sort of relationship to. Maybe you used to live there in childhood or went to college there. And then the next best market after that would be a place where you really build a deep team that your real estate agent, your property manager, and your cleaners, they have that area knowledge and they're transferring it to you. So that's kind of always been my algorithm. And I think that applies to, to short-term rental as well, right? We can think of short-term rentals as these big, you know, 10 bed, 12 bath vacation homes, and that's great, but it could also just be a normal single family home in your local market if there's an you know if there's a reason why people are coming to your city there probably is every yeah. city has some amount of travelers coming through there's optionality there that you could convert it to a long-term rental if needed you could sell it to a typical homeowner if needed but you have deep area knowledge that you can bring so that you can have an asymmetric advantage in that area and then i'm also a big believer that wherever you invest deeply invest in that area which is kind of counterintuitive people really mm -hmm. talk a lot about diversification. Yeah. I'm a big believer in consolidation. So we have mm. you know 200 million in Rochester, which is only a town of about 150,000. We have about 100 million in Tacoma, Washington. But that gives us such deep market knowledge and yep. market efficiencies versus having a portfolio that would be spread out all over the country. So th those are some you know, kind of investing fundamentals that I think of that if I was building or scaling a short-term rental portfolio from scratch, those would be some of the things I would be thinking about. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you heard about Mayor's expansion. Did you like if somebody were to try to learn about those macroeconomic things that shift shift the market? Where would you suggest that they start to look? Mm, right. Excellent yeah. question. Yeah. So much of this information is just publicly available, right? Of okay. what's in the local paper, what's in the little, you know, magazines in the, you know, that's at restaurants. What do you see? What's the hubbub in town? Um, what's happening in, you know, most cities have little Facebook groups, like I'm in, you know, Rochester moms groups, those sorts of things. So just getting kind of the local drumbeat, seeing construction, seeing things, you know, is, is very helpful as you're, you know, driving. That's why I think investing locally is so powerful because you physically see it with your own yeah. eyes of, hey, there's cranes over there that I didn't see a few weeks ago what's going on over there in terms of, you know, larger scale expansions, like say a major employer in your area mm -hmm. expanding the best place for that information is city council. So we attend all of our city council meetings. Mayo Mayo has an interesting relationship with Rochester, but I'm sure relationships like this exist in many cities where there's large employers um, where they have to submit their strategic plan every year. And it's a five year strategic plan. They include some things in there that are either like on their wish list or I swear, I think they include decoys. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but I, I really think they do because otherwise everyone would just follow Mayo. Right. right. And then we we learned of the Mayo expansion the same way everyone else did, which was a big you know release in the public newspaper. So we had some sense that Mayo was going to expand because you can physically look at the lots and see that they're abandoned lots in the middle of downtown Rochester where, you know, miraculously buildings had been torn down over the last mm. 10 years and they were all next to each other. So you can get some sense of, hmm, I wonder who the big player in town is that's, you know, scooping up all these lots. But then we didn't make the decision to convert the, the into the short-term rental portfolio until it was public knowledge in the newspaper with the specific dates, the specific plan. They released the map, the size of the hospital, the scheduling, those sorts of things. Um, so we had some sense from local knowledge and city council but then the bulk of it was just from public information that was available. Okay. So this may be almost like shifting gears and it's a weird time to kind of shift gears, but I think it's really important because whenever I have you <laughs> on the screen with me, th there's something that I know that you do very well, which is huge goal setting. Mm. And, I, and I, I didn't mention this <clears throat> at first, but I think it's, it's, it's something I should talk about. Like, how do you go... Uh, What's your process now for going mentally, should I say, for your next big goal? Mm. Yeah. 
it, it, there's there's so much to unpack there, right? We could do you know a yeah. whole episode on that. Absolutely. I I am a big believer in people having a relationship with their future selves, mm-hmm. and kind of the the contrary to that is you just wake up and you just kind of get through each day, and before you know it, you've had another birthday, another anniversary, another new year, and you know, maybe you have some sense the time is slipping by, and maybe you're setting some goals, but it's hard to see kind of how they're all linked together versus having this deep relationship with your future self. And the interesting thing about your future self is there are many of them. So Mm -hmm. you can have a relationship with your future self of, let's say it's noon when you're listening to this, who do you want to be this evening? What are the things that are on your schedule? How do you want to show up? What energy do you want to have? What outcomes do you want to have? Maybe you have a um, a, a meeting for a, you know, a local thing that you volunteer in, what energy do you want to bring? What outcome do you want from that? Maybe you're spending time with your children. Do you want to put your phone away? What do you want to talk about with the children? What food do you want to eat with them? You can have a relationship with your future self after you have passed away. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want people to say about you after you're gone? What memories do you want people to have? I think a really powerful time frame is about a three to five year time frame. A year is great. I think a quarter is even better because it's very actionable. It's hard to waste time in just one quarter. But three to five years is really a time frame when you can have a radically different life. So let's say you're thinking of starting or scaling a short-term rental portfolio. You can set some quarterly goals of like, listen to all of the videos in this summit, take action, sign up for mentorship, hire a real estate agent. You can set, say, some annual goals of I'd like to have one or two operational short-term rentals. But if you're thinking about radical life change of I'd like to cut back at work, I'd like to move locations, I'd like to change careers, you know, whatever it is, three to five years is long enough that you can really implement drastic life change but also close enough in time that it feels tangible that, you know, so much of life isn't going to have changed 10 years. It starts to get a little fuzzy, right? Of like, what's technology <laughs> going to be in a pandemic and all of the things. So having these relationships with your future selves and picking different timeframes, and it can be as simple as just sitting down with a pen and paper and just writing out the time. So maybe it's this evening, maybe it's your legacy after you've passed away. Maybe it is that three to three to five year time frame, and visualizing Who are you? What are you doing? What are your habits? What is your daily schedule? What are the key metrics for you? Like maybe it's your passive income, your net worth, the size of your family, where you live, like the key things that are how many hours a week you're working, the key things that are most important to you. And you just write that down and you try to visualize it as much as possible in a picture, if that's what makes sense for you. If you've honed your visualization skills, people can often see like snippets of like a movie in their mind. But the more real you make it, the more likely it is to come true. Humans are the only creatures that we know of that have the ability to see the future and then make it a reality versus, say, like just a, an animal living in the wild that's just you know focusing on food and reproduction and survival. Humans have the ability to look at the future and then create our realities to match that. So if, you know, if short-term rentals is your thing, think about what's your quarterly goal, what's your annual goal, what's your three to five-year goal? How can this part of your life change your entire life for the better in that three to five-year time frame? And then you know, do deep visualization exercises for that. Oh, I am thank so happy with up. myself like my right now. That's my favorite thing to talk about. So thank you. I am so happy that I didn't let that gem <laughs> just go to waste. That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you. Okay. I mean, where can people find you? If someone wants to either, you know, connect with you, with your team, with Black Swan, get into your world, how can they find you? Absolutely. So I'm very active on Facebook, Elaine Stogaberg. Our website is meetblackswan.com, meetblackswan.com. That has all the connections for signing up for our weekly newsletter. We have a monthly Zoom teaching call we call Community Power Hour. Our newsletter, all of the things are there right on meetblackswan.com. I have a very active real estate group on Facebook called Real Estate at Scale. So lots of different ways to be in relationship with me. I love to stay connected with people. If you go to meetblackswan.com, that kind of gives you all the pipelines to go down. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your your gems, your wisdom with the SCR Fest. <laughs> Pleasure. It was, it was awesome to be here. Thank you for having me. I hope you got a ton of value from this interview. Now, if you got any value from it, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to get your copy of the STR Blueprint to get your first or next short-term rental, 
go to thestrbook.com.